On this All Saints Sunday, I want to begin by sharing a few words from one of the saints. Timothy Lull was a pastor and teacher who died too young and whose writings I have appreciated much. The saints cheer me up, he said 40 years ago in a sermon. When I think about them, I'm suddenly rescued from my self-pity. I go around a lot of the time thinking that this is the hardest time ever to be a Christian. But considering the lives of God's people in all times and places puts my own struggles and difficulties in good perspective. It's never been easy to be a Christian. And perhaps it isn't even especially difficult now. I like the earthiness of those remarks very much. All Saints Day has so many risks. The risk of lifting up other Christians as untouchable icons of human perfection. The risk of becoming overly sentimental. The risk of the day only being about things that happened long ago and far away from our own experience. But maybe this day is meant to cheer us to encourage us, to remind us that we are in very good company in our struggle to live as people of faith in this complex world. Lutherans, after all, tend to use the word saints in the way the New Testament uses that word to describe all the faithful, not just an exceptional few. Paul lovingly addressed his letters uh, to the Christian communities as to the saints and reminded them that this was their calling, to be saints, to be people conformed to Christ and shaped by his life. Saints are not the perfect ones. They are the ones on the journey. You and me and the people around you this morning and those who have gone before us. It is not easy to follow Christ in the world, but it never has been. You are in very good company. Let that fact cheer you today. So to help us think about this wide gathering of the faithful that stretches beyond this room and even beyond this moment, we have the Beatitudes this morning, Jesus's famous teaching from the Gospel of Matthew. We're going to dive in there in just a moment, but before we do, we need to talk just a little bit about that word that Jesus uses over and over again in this passage. What do you think of when you hear the word blessed? It's a word that gets tossed around quite a lot. It's worth being clear about just what we mean when we use it. And if you want a wide sampling of how a word is used today, what better place to go than Twitter? So I typed in the hashtag blessed and spent three minutes looking at the first post that came up. It seemed like half of them were related to American football. A player had won a game or was about to be drafted by multiple competitive universities. Blessed. Most of the others had something to do with a new acquisition. A new house, a new car, a new girlfriend, a new boyfriend. Blessed. Some were tied to work, of course, to promotions, a presentation that went well, a salary bonus. Blessed. And the strangest one I saw in the three minutes that I looked was apparently by somebody who had just won a mixed martial arts match. The post included a photo of this tough looking guy who had just pounded his opponent into the mat. Arms raised high, hashtag blessed. <laughs> so I don't know just what you think of when you hear the word blessed, but in the broad culture around us, people usually use it when they are talking about some tangible reward or benefit or accomplishment in their lives. I'm not at all sure that God's in the business of dishing out new cars and football trophies, but that's for another sermon. For our purposes today, the problem with hearing the word blessed in that common way is that what Jesus says then makes no sense at all. Virtually nothing in his list lines up with the idea of a present reward or success. Jesus doesn't say blessed are the lucky, he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. He doesn't say blessed are the hardworking. 
He says, blessed are those who mourn. He doesn't say blessed are the athletic or blessed are the rich. He says blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. If being blessed means having some admirable accomplishment in the present, then what Jesus says makes no sense at all. But that's not what the word Jesus uses here meant. The Greek word makarios can also be translated as happy, which gives the passage a pretty different tone, or it can be translated as greatly honored. Greatly honored. And to me, that opens up the Beatitudes in a whole new way. Jesus is speaking in a way that has roots deep in the Hebrew scriptures in the Old Testament, where you can find lots of writing about the sort of person who is blessed, particularly in the Psalms. Blessed are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, says Psalm 1. Blessed are those who make the Lord their trust, says Psalm 40. Blessed are those whose hope is in the Lord their God, says Psalm 146. The word blessed carries the sense of honor here. God honors the people who do these things, who live in these ways, who live with wisdom and trust and hope. The Psalms lift this up as a way of life that is honoring to God and that God therefore honors. And Jesus does say some of the same kinds of things in the reading we heard today. God honors you when you show mercy. God honors you when you are a peacemaker. God honors you when you hunger for righteousness. They're all ways of life that honor God and God honors in response. It's kind of like what the psalm says. But some of what Jesus says is very different. God honors you when you are mourning. God honors you when you are persecuted. God honors you when you are broken, we might say. God greatly honors you then. Not when you are at your strongest and most successful. Not when you are feeling like posting pictures of a latest accomplishment on Twitter. Not when you have just won at life. When you are at your weakest, God greatly honors you then. You are blessed. It's very strange, this way of speaking, but it helps to look at the verses that come just before the Beatitudes, just before Jesus launches into this teaching. Just a few verses earlier, Matthew tells us that Jesus' fame had grown and the people brought to him all the sick, those who were afflicted with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, and paralytics, and he cured them. Jesus is not off in some ivory tower when he starts speaking about who's blessed. He is looking at people like this. People who can't control themselves. People who are poor in body and in spirit. People who mourn the loss of their health and their freedom and their community. God greatly honors them, he says. They are dear to God's heart. Keeping that message front and center in our lives is not easy because it really does go against everything that feels logical and apparent to us. Reformed churches in South Africa made a strong step in this direction when they wrote the Belhar Confession in the midst of apartheid in the 1980s. This confession of faith includes many powerful statements, but including this one, which might be a summary of much of the Beatitudes. God, in a world of injustice and enmity, is in a special way the God of the destitute, the poor, and the wronged. Those who are broken are not outside God's care. In fact, God is in a special way their God. And we must never forget this. So where does all this business of who God honors fit into All Saints Day? into this day when we recall the cloud of witnesses around us. I think part of the reason for the, this reading this morning has to do with this business about God honoring those who mourn. You are not forgotten when you are torn up by loss. God bends to you and tends to you. God honors you especially then. But I think that's not the only way we might hear this on All Saints Day. On All Saints Day, the Beatitudes remind us in the broadest sense that God's promises are especially meant to wrap us up when we are in need. 
Without thinking about it much, I imagine we often operate with the idea that God's promises only make sense when life is good, when we know God's care, when we are feeling hashtag blessed. God's promises are meant to be the blanket around your shoulders, though, particularly when you don't you know, feel God's care. They are meant to wrap you up and hold you precisely then. God's promises are meant for those who are persecuted and threatened because of their faith. They are meant for those struggling against injustice and depression, dreaming of something better. They're also for the elderly person who feels forgotten and abandoned, and for the young man struggling to understand his sexuality, unsure of who could possibly understand him, and for the family caring for a grandparent with dementia, watching a loved one slip helplessly away and for the young woman mourning the loss of a job. God's promises are there in the moments when they are most needed. Jesus was telling his disciples this as he looked out at the crowds of hurting people gathered around him. God greatly honors people like that, he said. Ordinary, broken people struggling to live faithfully in the world. Saints, in other words, the promises of God are there for you, just like they have been for the faithful for centuries, to encourage you, to sustain you, to give you hope. Hear that word this All Saints Day. The promises of God are for you when you need them most. So take heart, be of good cheer. You are in good company. Amen.